It is a common narrative. The private sector is filled with risk-loving venture capitalists, in contrast to the public sector, replete with its risk-averse bureaucracy. But our next guest sees a world where the public sector is the one taking the risks, while the private sector leans back and reaps the rewards. Joining us now with more, here is Mariana Mazzucato. She is an economist and author of The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myths, and we are happy to welcome you here to our studios at TVO. Thank you. Where does that narrative come from in the first place, that all the risk takers and sharpies are in the private sector and all the leeches and risk averse people are in the public sector? Well, first of all, I think that there's two reasons we have that narrative, and then historically it has evolved in different ways. The first reason is that there is massive profits to be made from that narrative. Um, it was actually the National Venture Capital Association that in 1976 in the U.S. started to lobby hard for capital gains tax to fall. Um, they were formed in 1976 as an association, and already in 1981, capital gains tax fell, had fallen, by 50%, from 40% to 20%. So they did their job. They did their job, and the problem is that we have no evidence um, economically, especially from uh, people like myself that actually do sector-level analysis, that that kind of a tax reduction actually stimulates investment, because what drives business investment is really the perception about where the future technological and market opportunities are, and Warren Buffett himself is famous for having said that you know, tax has never affected where he invests, mm -hmm. um, let alone innovation um, investments, you know, sort of R&D, research and development. You don't just spend on it because it's cheap to do so because someone's reduced your tax. You spend because you think there's a big opportunity. Um, but the other thing is I think that since the 70s and really, I'd say, early 80s with the whole Thatcher and Reagan attack on the state, um, the narrative around that in order to actually reduce the size of the state has been very much been one that we're doing it in order to make the economy more competitive, more innovative. Of course, today the narrative is about cutting you know, budget deficits because of what happened uh, after the crisis with public debt having to rise so much in order to bail out uh, the banks and the private sector. But this narrative really does date back to the 80s, and it's been part and parcel of this attempt to reduce the state um, with the idea that by doing so, you will release all this sort of dynamism. And so what I've tried to do is actually to look at those countries and those regions within countries where you have had that kind of innovation-led growth and um, you know, what role did the state play? Did it just have to get out of the way and did the private sector then kind of do its thing or something else? And the answer is something else. Something else. I, I was going to say, I infer from the way you've just laid that out that you're not exactly on side with that narrative. Yeah. So yeah. basically what I found in places like Silicon Valley, but I would argue in places like China today, Finland, Denmark, Germany, Brazil, is that the private sector really only enters these difficult spaces. Because don't forget, innovation is really difficult. Most of it fails. Most R&D projects fail. It is really uncertain, not just risky. It is exposed to what uh, Frank Knight, a famous uh, economist in the 1920s, talked about in terms of fundamental uncertainty. We just don't know. Um, and so uh, the private sector, which is, is risk averse in general, but especially around innovation, they are not willing to absorb that kind of level of uncertainty. So in biotechnology, uh, venture capitalists only entered about 20 years after the state made the leading investments around uh, you know, the underlying knowledge base. We've seen this with nanotechnology, with the internet, and we're witnessing it today with uh, clean technology. The state lays out the path and then lays the private out the sector paths, uh, but, but, but what's interesting is that you know, I'm an economist, and economists, when they want to talk about the role of the state in this process, at best talk about the state and funding things like basic research, which is understood to be a public good with very high spillovers. It's hard to appropriate the profits from that, and so people more or less agree that, okay, fine, the state has to fund the big science. But the reality is that with all the general purpose technologies, these are the big innovations, you know, like whether it was the internet, nuclear power, mass production, um, and we're hoping today different technologies around green technology, the state didn't just fund the basic research, it actually funded most of the whole innovation chain, including applied research and early stage seed funding for actual companies. So the, in the US, the Small Business Innovation Research Program, funded by the US government, has funded more companies than the entire uh, public, uh, sorry, private venture capital industry. Mm -hmm. Apple, Compaq, and Intel all got uh, loans and grants from that um, fund. 
Um, and what we don't realize then is that, you know, even today, say with Tesla, which is the new hero in Silicon Valley, you know, um, Elon Battery Musk. powered car. Yeah. Um, Tesla received a 500 million guaranteed loan from Obama, um, making billions today, this particular um, initiative. Uh, Solyndra received the same amount. And everyone knows about Solyndra Solyndra because it went bust. Belly up and was a huge embarrassment for Obama. Exactly. But this is the problem that if the state does take the sort of lead role, which it has taken, again, it funded the internet, um, it funded all the technologies behind the iPhone, uh, everything that makes the iPhone smart, internet, GPS, touchscreen display, Siri, all government funded. Uh, All those technologies were, in fact, picked as many companies have been picked. And the point is that just like with uh, private venture capital, you win some, you lose some, right? <laughs> no. But the problem is that because we don't admit the state plays this role, we haven't allowed the state to reap back the rewards from the successes. So Tesla was a success, Solyndra wasn't. If we had allowed some of the profits that were generated then from Tesla or from Apple or from Google, Google's algorithm was funded by the NSF, National Mm. Science Foundation, to come back to the state. It could also then fund the losses, the Solyndras, as well as the next round. In whose interest is it to continue that narrative that the private sector gets the credit whenever something great, based on public research, happens, but the public sector has to carry the can for the fact that anything might fail? Right. Well, first of all, I summarize that problem as socialization of risk, privatization of reward, which is interesting because people have used that uh, sentence to describe what went wrong with the banking system, right? We allow the banks to make the profits in good times. When things go bad, the state Socialized has to come in and, yeah, and bail them out. But I often argue that's exactly what I see in the innovation economy. And I think that in the long run, no one benefits. Because in the long run, that dynamic, which is a dysfunctional dynamic, will hurt future innovation. It will hurt capitalism, which is based on innovation, you know, unlike feudalism that for 500 years had no innovation, it was inertial. But in the short run, um, as I was saying before, there are uh, um, benefits to those who are propagating this line because, again, they can then portray the state as this meddler, an inertial dinosaur, bureaucratic, an impediment to innovation. Or in and fact, so they don't argue get the first for, place without it. Yeah, we'll argue for lower tax, lower regulation, mm-hmm. which in the short run does increase profits. No. But it also fuels inequality. I mean, my line is that inequality today is mainly fueled through these kind of value extraction techniques. Let me read you a quote from The Economist and get your view on this. Uh, They wrote, governments have always been lousy at picking winners and they are likely to become more so as legions of entrepreneurs and tinkerers swap designs online, turn them into products at home and market them globally from a garage. As the revolution rages, governments should stick to the basics. Better schools for a skilled workforce, clear rules and a level playing field for enterprises of all kinds, leave the rest to the revolutionaries. Right. What do you think? So, um, well, that quote is basically repeating the line that all you need the state for is to fund the basics, to, if you want, create the conditions for innovation and then to stand back and to see it happen through these garage tinkers, right? And, um, and these revolutionaries are somehow the creative dynamic ones versus the boring, you know, dinosaur state. And what my book is about is really telling the opposite story, where these revolutionaries, in fact, only get their guts up to invest and to be revolutionary. Think of Steve Jobs' wonderful phrase that you have to be hungry, be foolish, um, once the state has actually absorbed, again, the main uncertainty. And unless, you know, if we look at countries which don't have that kind of public sector funding, then the venture capital industry has no wave to surf. And I you know, purposely use the word surf because the whole venture capital, uh, if you want, movement really did start in California. Um, but if you ask yourselves what, again, makes the iPhone revolutionary, it was state funds. Um, because what would you do with your iPhone today if it couldn't do all those wonderful things that the state-funded technology did? So what- and today in green technology, because this is the, you know, mm-hmm. hopefully going to be the next big thing, if you look around the world, it's actually public investment banks. This is the new big thing. Mm-hmm. Development banks, state investment banks, the KFW in Germany, the Brazilian Development Bank, the China Development Bank. Oh, we've got one here. 
Um, what's it called? Yeah, business Development Bank or Canadian Business Development Bank, something like that. I'm sure it's a smaller thing than the Chinese one or that kind of thing. But. Yeah. Um, well, it's interesting because, for example, in the UK as well, we're setting one up, but it's still going to actually work through the private banks. It's not direct lending, and it's not lending towards, if you want, the big new missions, say, you know, solving climate change. In the green economy, what's interesting, if you look at all the funds around the world, private and public, these these four, uh, it's a European Investment Bank, Brazilian Development Bank, KFW, the German Bank, and the Chinese Development Bank are spending together eight times as much as the entire worldwide private sector, hmm. private equity, venture capital, corporate investments, and stock market. And what credit will they get when things that they invest in pay off? Very little. But you will know when they fail. Um, and in <laughs> fact, any time that these banks do you know, uh, create an investment, if you want, you know, invest in an area that maybe isn't profitable right away or there's some problem. We, of course, hear that story. We don't hear the, the positive story, which is really over the history of capitalism, where these kinds of agencies, which in the US might have been DARPA or today ARPA-E, DARPA, again, funded the internet. ARPA-E is trying to do for energy what DARPA did for the internet or these kind of banks. They didn't just fix markets. They you know, actively shaped and created markets. But in economics, we don't even have words to talk about this. Hence, then, our indicators that we use to actually evaluate the performance of such banks or these agencies are very much tainted by this faulty framework, which doesn't get the point in the first place. When it comes to innovation, how important do you think the role of the government is in the Canadian economy in particular? Well, from, I'm not an expert on Canada. I do know that Canada, though, is um, subject to a very big problem, which is it has very low business R&D spending. It has lower than the OECD average. It's something like 1.6, whereas the OECD average is just over 2. Um, so businesses aren't spending enough on R&D. And for the last 10 or so years, this narrative in Canada, which has been very strong, I mean, you know, even stronger than in, in many European countries today, post-crisis that are being told, you know, you have to make the state smaller in order to have post-crisis recovery, this narrative that somehow, you know, we have to um, reduce the size of the state, uh, reap surpluses, not deficits, um, is, has hurt, I think, the ability of Canadian business itself to interact with this difficult world of innovation. Mm -hmm. You also have very high hoarding rates. What's um, that? Hoarding. So businesses are actually not spending money at all. They take their tax um, cut and they sit on it. Yeah. In the US, by the way, the, the amount of hoarding currently is something like $2 trillion. In, mm -hmm. in Europe, it's close to $1 trillion. In Canada alone, it's close to $600 billion. Um, Our so the finance question, ministers called it dead money. The governor yes. of the Bank of Canada called it dead money. Yes, that's right. Carney. Sits there and does yeah. nothing. Yeah, exactly. Carney. But so then the question is, what should uh, government do in order to unleash that money? And this idea that you're going to unleash it just by different types of tax cuts or reductions of regulation is really the wrong route, just if you look again at the history of uh, uh, what's happened in, in other countries. So I would really, if you want, uh, shout a big warning to the Canadian government that if they want to. Um, First of all, become less concentrated just around the extractive uh, you know, sector, but also force that sector itself to invest its profits in these new areas. Because the, it's, it's not just the sort of high tech you know, IT area that's exciting. Any sector can be forced to actually transform itself and to really um, you know, accept the challenges that the future is presenting. And I think the real problem with the Canadian economy is not so much that you know, it's too focused say, on mining. It's that, that those companies engaged in mining are not reinvesting their profits in areas that can make that particular sector uh, adapt to a world that's changing and, um, and invest in the big new areas. I mean, think of the Chinese economy. They're spending $1.7 trillion in um, their five-year plan on these seven emerging sectors, which include new engines, um, new generation IT, environmentally friendly technologies, and they're increasing their R&D spending by 170 um, percent. And so, you know, this is the challenge: how to actually interact with innovation-led competition. A little easier when you're an authoritarian dictatorship, though, isn't it? Well, this is what's interesting about China. I think they're also very adaptive. They're they're learning the right lessons from Silicon Valley. Uh, the real question in China is not so much, um, you know, well, the question in China really is, 
are they going to go down the wrong route of thinking that it can all be top down, which is basically what your question is getting at. So the Soviet Union, for example, had lots of R&D spending, but it was too vertical. It wasn't enough uh, distributed throughout the whole economy. It was all focused around sort of the defense area, not the civil sectors. And they didn't have these horizontal linkages, for example, between science and industry. And so Japan, at the same time, that was spending less R&D, they were spending quite a bit on R&D, but it had a less R&D to GDP ratio. R&D is research and development. Mm -hmm. To GDP, they grew more because they had these strong uh, horizontal linkages, which actually allowed this new knowledge to really diffuse throughout the economy. OK, so Soviets didn't do it well. Chinese, you say, are doing well, Chinese, it well. Chinese, what I'm Who I, else is doing it right? Well, the Chinese, the big challenge in China, sorry, is that they should learn also from the Silicon Valley model, which is that it's happened through a decentralized network of state agencies. Instead, currently, you have this big China Development Bank, for example, that's funding you know, lots of companies. Individual companies getting up to $2 billion uh, loans. That's massive. Doesn't Huawei. Sound decentralized, though. The bank is not decentralized, right. but the loans. That's not the problem. Again, in the US, people don't realize this, but you know, the CIA itself has had one of the biggest public venture capital funds called InQtel, the SBIR program, NSF, the National Institutes of Health spend 32 billion a year in the US, hmm. okay, on one sector, pharma slash biotech. So no one's sort of going after the US for being anti-competitive because it's quite decentralized and in some ways it's hidden. Right, whereas the Chinese have this big bank and also a big ministry of you know, innovation and research, which is um, up until now sort of top down and um, administering these funds. And I think the challenge will be, but they're very quick learners, to allow a more decentralized structure of publicly funded agencies to interact alongside the, pub mm. the uh, private sector. How much buy in are you finding around the world for this new narrative that you are suggesting? Mm. Well, I've been uh, very happily surprised, if you want, of how uh, receptive people have been from both business, um, public policymakers, and, and the public at large. I've, I've, I've been going actually around the world talking about it, mainly invited, to be honest, by governments to come and talk to them about how to uh, address the challenges. And, but I must say that amongst the business sector, it's, you know, it, has, it has tended to be the more visionary people, individuals within companies that have really sort of not just bought the line, but have wanted to really engage about it. Because they do know where their profits come from. They do know that in the long run, in order to be a competitive company that is able to uh, you know, compete with, whether it's the Chinese or the Germans that have you know, the KFW Bank and have these Fraunhofer Institutes, which in Germany do provide these horizontal linkages, they too will need that kind of support. And the big question for them is, you know, well, the question I ask them is, where will the public sector, where will government get the money to provide you with that kind of support if the constant narrative is instead that you are so impeded by too much tax, too much regulation, instead of a different narrative, which is how to set up what I call a symbiotic uh, ecosystem, because this is the new trendy word, ecosystem, mm -hmm. right? Everyone talks about public-private partnerships and ecosystems. I always say we need to make sure we have a symbiotic ecosystem and not a parasitic ecosystem, which we currently have. And they get a bit tense when I say when that. you say parasite, that's not a Well, I mean, a you know, word. biologists, when they look at ecosystems, they do look <laughs> at you know, predator, prey, uh, uh, parasitic symbiosis. And so the real question is also, what kind of indicators can policymakers have to judge whether the kind of you know, public-private partnerships that they're building are, in fact, ones that are symbiotic, where both parties can share the risks and share the rewards. Do you know what, though? I thought, I mean, we've had a conservative government in Canada for the last, uh, where are we, since 2006. And uh, you know, of course, we understand that their mantra has been, got to cut taxes, got to get the government out of the way, got to do this and that and the other thing. But there was a liberal government before that mm. that was not really beating the drum, yeah. championing the role of the state in any of what you're talking about either. Has the tone of the conversation changed so much around the world that even liberal governments who may, uh, small l, liberal yeah. governments, who, who see a role for the state, who understand the contribution the state makes to all of what you've talked about, mm -hmm. can't champion it because it just, it's too off message from what the public wants nowadays, which is lower taxes, lower taxes, lower taxes. I think there's two issues. One is when they're just completely misguided, mm -hmm. <laughs> and one when they've actually bought in to the wrong narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I think back to you know Tony Blair and his third way, it's it's exactly what you just mentioned. You know, this was a liberal government which mm -hmm. actually accepted some pretty uh, useless policies, or if you want, instituted them, which was all about releasing this wonderful dynamism in their supposed uh, you know innovative business sector. So, for example, it was 
was actually a labor government um, under Tony Blair. It, it was when um, uh, Gordon Brown was the uh, finance minister that reduced the time that private equity has to be invested in order to reap um, capital gains tax reductions from 10 years to um, two years. Why would they do that? Because the idea was that somehow what was impeding innovation was the lack of finance and the lack of you know, freeing up the finance from these impediments of you know, taxation. Was it the wrong and move? Completely the wrong move. All that increases is the time that people golf. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> increase the time that they invest in uh, innovation. And it increases inequality. Uh, one of the key drivers today of inequality are these massively, you know, these massive changes that are happening to tax from these kind of policies. But I would argue even in the US, you know, Obama, right after the crisis, really did try at least to have um, a stimulus program that was directed around green. He also then you know, set up his um, Affordable Care Act through Obamacare. And he was constantly, um, how do you say, um, hammered away by saying, oh, you're meddling in our, say, choices around health care. Mm -hmm. Now, why did none of his advisors in a liberal administration not help him change that narrative? All he had to say was, we're meddling in your health care? We've created your health care. Who produces the drugs? He said that the other day. He Did said, he? Well, well he must have read my book because I know a, he has it. <laughs> he's a, is that, how do you know he's got it? Uh, well, I have my contacts. You have your sources. I was just in Washington, and I gave a talk in front. Well, um, I've been now twice there in the last um, four months, but I gave a talk in front of his uh, lead um, advisors okay. for science and technology. He's only recently started to suggest that there's something really good about Obamacare. And whereas all oh. the people who are running for re-election, of course, in 2014 mm -hmm. are running for the hills away from it because they think it's a turkey. But what I mean is he should have said, in terms of the innovation economy, should have said, we have created, by we I mean public sector budget, so the National Institutes of Health, yep. which every year have been spending around $32 billion, have, are actually responsible for something like three-fourths of the revolutionary, coming back to that quote you just read from The Economist, drugs, which in that particular sector, it's great because we actually have the data on which are the Me Too drugs, slight variations of existing drugs versus the revolutionary drugs, which are these new molecular entities with priority rating. 75% of the NMEs, new molecular entities with priority rating, which are the revolutionary drugs that people need for, you know, to, to, uh, for their health care, were funded by government. And so, you know, I'm not saying he had to yell it as I'm yelling it to you, but he could very gently get that message Suggest across. Suggest that governments and, are not all evil. Well, that they're not just meddling, they're actually creating, they're active investors. Okay, I'm down to my last minute here. Let me ask you one last thing. Do you see, I mean, here's, this is your position. You were here recently for the Broadband Institute making this point as well. Do you see a pendulum starting to swing the other way as the world grapples with these issues? Um, I see it, it's very skewed, it's very uneven. Some countries are getting it, some are not. And so what we will see, I think, in the next uh, sort of 10 years is that those countries that aren't getting this, in other words, that it's not just about cutting back and it's not even just about spending, but it's about spending strategically. And in order to do that, you actually have to make it fun to work in government. You have to make the top graduates think it's just as cool to go work in a public sector institution like ARPA-E in the, in the US and you have your own public sector institution institutions that are thinking about innovation as it is to go work in Google or in Goldman Sachs. But that will never happen if we're constantly bashing government. So you're going to have a self-fulfilling prophecy that the more we bash government, the more in fact it does become this inertial kind of bureaucratic uh, impeder <laughs> of innovation. But when you actually have a vision, a mission-oriented understanding of what government can do, the real debate should be what should those missions be, whether it's about climate change, the aging crisis, youth unemployment, not about just getting government out of the way. And some countries are getting it. Grazie, signora. Prego. That's Mariana Mazzucato, who is the professor in the economics of innovation at the University of Sussex. Her book is called The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myths. Grazie. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.